Watch Summer's End, a dramatization of the summer of 1939 and the time that marked the finds at Sutton Hoo and the beginning of World War II. In the summer of 1939, in the last few weeks of peacetime, an incredible find was unearthed in a rural Suffolk town. As the darkness of World War descended on Europe, a new world was discovered, one which would illuminate the secrets of our past. Told from the perspective of Peggy Piggott, a young archaeologist who was there, Summer's End uses dramatic reconstruction and archive film to tell the story of two of the country's most significant moments in history. I never thought something like that would happen to me. The devastation of war claimed even the blades of grass that brightened the grey winters. The long forgotten earth has seen the light after barren years. It is put to barren use. Something so great, so unexpected. Men and women left everything that they were doing and hurried to shovel sand. In those first critical hours, they did indispensable work which no leader could have ordered and no money could have bought. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. We tried not to think what was happening. For it was almost unbearable. To find it just then, when the world was teetering on the edge, to lose everything in an instant. It was the end of summer when I got the telegram. Sutton Hoo was an ancient heath near the old market town of Woodbridge. The land belonged to a Mrs. Edith Pretty and the vast flatness of the heath was broken only by a group of burial mounds, centuries upon centuries old. Some called the area Little Egypt due to the sandiness of the soil. My summer holiday was cut short by the summons from Charles Phillips. Peggy, come at once. Remarkable find in Suffolk. I was young and with little fieldwork experience. I felt honoured to have been requested by Phillips personally. I had little idea then of what would be expected of me. Charles Phillips, a professor of Cambridge University, told me he had been visiting the area when by chance he had got wind that a local man had found something of interest beneath one of the mounds. The man had uncovered the remains of iron bolts, with a domed head at one end and a squarish plate at the other. They were unmistakably rivets, unmistakably belonging to a ship. The great settlement of Britain by the Angles, Saxons and Jutes in the darkest depths of our history had left little trace except these great mounds on the earth. Like great pregnant bellies, they punctuated the landscape. They housed the dead, the final resting place of a long lost people. According to tradition, great kings and leaders were buried in funeral boats which now served to take them on their last journey. There were stories of noble warriors and splendid burials, but no one had ever proven them as reality. They remained stories. And instead, the belief of a violent, war-wracked people held sway.
The Prime Minister has sent the German Führer the following message. In view of increasingly critical situation, I propose to come over at once to see you, with a view to trying to find a peaceful solution. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. In June of 38, the local museum in Ipswich gave Mrs. Pretty the services of an archaeologist to begin an excavation. Basil Brown was a local and rather exceptional man. He had no formal training in archaeology, and everything he knew was through his own dogged investigation of the surrounding area. With a weekly wage of 35 shillings and the help of two workers off the estate, Basil began his work. He dug the first trenches in three of the smallest burial mounds. He was to find only fragments, pieces of iron, remains of pottery. It was clear treasure hunters had plundered them centuries before, even if there had been anything to find at all. The dig had largely been fruitless, serving only to confirm what we already knew, with the hope of nothing more. And there was very little time. For the following year, in March of 39, the hope of peace crumbled. Hitler broke his agreement of not seizing more territory and marched unheeded into Prague. War looked ever more likely. But I knew nothing of it. As far as I was concerned, the moment it was declared, the sky would be black from planes, oblivion coming shortly afterwards. And so Mrs. Pretty insisted on the largest burial mound to be investigated, the one in which she had always been most interested. But it was presumed to have likely been plundered before. I heard afterwards that there had been seen the ghostly figures of ancient soldiers marching on this mound. I hadn't known what to expect, and I was staggered by what I saw. There, uncovered, was what must have been a hundred-foot-long boat. Its wood had completely rotted away, leaving a delicate imprint of the rows of ship rivets in the sandy soil. I held my breath. It seemed utterly exposed caught out at last in its long, forgotten hiding place. I was struck deeply by the notion that if I looked away, it would disappear. Basil, who had come so far in the discovery of a lifetime, was designated the assistant of Charles Phillips, who had soon taken the charge of the dig. For such a remarkable find, it was seen that a professional hand was needed. And so by mid-July, my work began. I was to be one of the principal excavators of the centre and west of the site. I soon knew that we were the first that could be mustered in light of the situation in Europe. I began by dividing the ship into a grid and started clearing where we believed the burial chamber to be. The last days of summer were stifling, 
and by the evening my whole body was exhausted. Even so, my mind kept on with thoughts of discovery and possibility, but with each day, a fear grew stronger of everything soon to be shattered to pieces. Newspapers were reporting that the museums and galleries in London were removing artefacts to the countryside. Meanwhile, we picked each precious and fragile grain from the ground. I had to steady my hands. It was difficult not to rush. By the end of July, planes passed overhead from the nearby RAF bases. And then, quite unexpectedly, something in front of me glistened. It was a small object, made from garnet and gold. It was so strikingly bright. It was as though someone had just placed it in the soil only yesterday. From that moment on, we were immensely excited. If you are provided with a steel shelter and have not erected it, do so at once. First, dig a pit four feet deep. Then, build your shelter inside it. When you hear these warning sirens, take cover at once. There came endless advice in the preparation for war household and everyday tips. Have buckets of water and sand on every landing. Keep pencil and paper by your wireless set. And we had our own improvisations, making do with what was to hand. We used crates from the local greengrocer, cotton wool from the chemists at Woodbridge. Mrs. Pretty gave us her tea towels, and we used moss from the nearby woods to pack our findings. Clear your loft of all junk to minimize risk of fire. You must be ready to obscure all lights in your house. Pay no attention to rumors. Avoid panic buying. Always keep your gas mask handy in the house. The warning may be short. Prepare now. For from the moment when I simply plucked that first piece from the ground, the gold appeared in abundance. It poured from the earth. Coins, beautifully detailed purses, silver bowls, a gold-handled sword, intricately wrought armour. Gold leaf caught in the air and flew about us. It seemed the ship was allowing us to be part of the story. This was a royal funeral hoard of no one other than a king. With every brushstroke, finding him seemed ever more possible the earth having already yielded so much of its dark kept secrets. Safeguarding the priceless gold was essential and Mrs. Pretty paid for two policemen to keep watch. It had all turned out to be true. It was unbelievable. 
As I thought of the tales of great warrior kings, I held the reality in my hands. But another reality, which now meant more than ever, dawned on me. With the stories of the beautiful kingdoms came the stories of their destruction. Now, Earth, hold what kings once held, and heroes can no more. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one, they went down to death. In two weeks, we had uncovered a royal ship burial, believed to be that of Radweld, one of the greatest Anglo-Saxon kings of Great Britain. The treasure was over one and a half thousand years old, from the heart of the Dark Ages. It was a time when people were thought to have descended into a miserable primitivism. That summer changed everything we thought we knew of our past. London was plunged into darkness. They were testing the blackout of the lights in Piccadilly. Our work was over. We hastily covered the ship with protective bracken and fern, and the finds were stored at the Aldwych tube station, returned to the ground once again. Anti-aircraft trenches were dug over our little Egypt. The land was flat, perfect for landing enemy aircraft. The mounds themselves proved perfect for exercise and in training the army tanks. A newly constructed barrow stood waiting on a wide headland close to the waves, its entryway secured. Into it, the keeper of the hoard had carried all the goods and golden ware worth preserving. His words were few. Now, Earth, hold what earls once held, and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first, by honorable men. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one they went down to death, looked their last on sweet life in the hall. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or burnish plated goblets, put a sheen on the cup. The companies have departed. The hard helmet, hasped with gold, will be stripped of its hoops, and the helmet shiner, who should polish the metal of the war mask, sleeps. The coat of mail that came through all fights, through shield collapse and cut of sword, decays with the warrior. Nor may webbed mail range far and wide on the warlord's back beside his mustard troops. No trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall, no swift horse pawing the courtyard. Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples.